All right, guys, we're going to cover a few things not directed at the language, Python, but just the environment. One of the assignments referenced a set Python command file, which is an assignment that I used to have, and then I removed it, and I didn't completely remove all the references from it for the assignment. So we're going to talk about a few things. One is how to launch the command prompt. I bet you all know how to do that. How to launch this, you don't necessarily have to type this stuff, the command prompt in a specific folder. And then how to get the path to the Python directory. Why would you need that? Because on your home machine, you might want to modify your path, your environment path. If you're using window, Windows. And you might want to make a set python.cmd file, which we're going to do in here. The instructions for that are actually already uploaded. I put a new assignment. So if we go out here, we go to scripting, we check Dropbox. I believe it's homework seven. We'll see some of this information. Or we won't. Dad gum it. Press no notes here. So anyways. Back to our agenda. Launching the command prompt. Pretty easy on Windows, and by the way, all of this is going to be addressed at Windows. If you're a Linux user, I assume you know already how to do all this stuff. If you're a Mac user, it's somewhat complicated by the fact that Macs already come with Python installed, but it's an old version of Python. And then you install a new version of Python on it, and it seems like it still runs the old one if you do it from the terminal. So anyways, launching the command prompt. Just hold down the Windows key and hit R, and you get the Run menu, the Run dialog, and just type CMD. Ta-da, there we are. All sorts of other ways to do it, but that's the fastest, just two keystrokes, you know. Command, R, CMD, and there we go. So inside the command prompt, you know, you can type dir and you can type cd and go into certain directories and whatever. Don't know why I have a music directory on this computer, but apparently there is one. We want you to be able to run Python from the command prompt. I believe these machines are now set up so that it actually works. When you install Python, it should set up the path appropriately to do that. And I found that the last few times I did, it didn't. So, that's one thing to note is how to launch the command prompt. Another is how to launch it in a specific directory. Say I had my scripting directory here. The problem is, is if I do this, command R, CMD, run it, I'm in this directory, I'd have to go looking for that scripting directory. CD desktop, oh, I hope it's there, CD scripting, you know, that kind of stuff way easier just to do this. Find the direct the folder that you want to go into. Hold shift and control. Right click and choose open command window here. I know there's a better option or a different option under Windows 8 and 10 but that one should still be there. Doubt they took it away. And now we're in the correct directory. You see that? So now if I type dir asterisk dot py I want to find all the files that end in py. There they are. If we want to run one of those scripts, I can type python space and then one of those file names, python oops.py, and it should run it. Apparently, I have a syntax error here. Maybe that's why it was called oops. Let's try another one. python og24.py. All right, it did something. Looks like it's working. So what if that didn't work? We now know how to do those two things. 
But what if it didn't work? What if I went in, typed, whoops, go back to the correct directory, control, shift, right click, open command window here, and then I did Python and it didn't work. That may be possible at home. It does work for everybody here, right? All of our machines are set up the same way? Yes, okay. In that case, you need to do one of two things, or both. One thing is you can do is to modify your search path. I'll show you what a search path is. I'm just going to close this command window, open one back up. If you type path, you get a list of all the directories. Those are the directories that Windows searches. If you type in a command, it looks for an executable file in one of those directories. If it doesn't find it in any of those directories, it just won't work. Like, we know Excel is installed on this machine, but if I type Excel, is it going to run? No, apparently not. Apparently, Excel is not in the search path. On the other hand, on just about every machine, every Windows machine, if you type Notepad, it is going to bring up an editor. And that's nice. You get a little bit of text editor. You can create your, your, uh, your script files, excuse me, your CMD files, formerly in previous lifetimes known as BAT files. So, we would need to add Python to this directory. It's actually already there, right? But if it wasn't there, here's what we would do. And this is all in instructions. We need to find the control panel. Sure, it's easy to find on Windows 7. On Windows 8, it may not have been so easy to find. I think on Windows 10, they made it easy to find again. You can always just type control panel into the search box, and hopefully it'll bring it up. Once you bring up the control panel, you come over here and type in path. And one of the choices is edit the system environment variables. Now, I don't think we're going to actually be able to make this change here. Because I doubt we have admin access to these machines. I would be really doubtful if I can come up here and choose path from the list of variables and click edit. What do you know? It's grayed out. But if I could, I would want to edit this. I would want to paste the path to Python in that directory. The way you find um, your environment variables will differ based on which version of Windows that you're using. I am not sure about sticking a new path variable in there. I wouldn't want to recommend that you do that. Might work really good. And if you're more confident about your uh, Windows management skills than I am, I'm totally hyped up about it. I just don't. I'll research that. I'll see if we can add something to our path by modifying this. We would not want to replace it, though. That'd be my fear. So to figure out how to modify your environment variables, I put a Word doc, or I put in my doc a link to a really nice description of how to change the environment variables on the uh, various versions of Windows. Scroll down, la di da di da. Here it is. It's actually on the Oracle's website on Java, but it's perfectly good information. Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, Windows Vista. Anybody running Vista or XP? Probably not, but... To run a different version of Java, you're going to go, well, we're not going to do that on Mac OS X. So, let's close all of that. We want to find the path. Why do we need the path? So that we could put it into that path variable via the means that I just showed you or by following the instructions here to figure out how to go to the path. So what we want to do is we want to launch idle, Python, whichever. IDLE, launch. And we have a little three line script here that should give us the path to the Python directory. And if you go to a search box and you type python.exe and it searches your drive and it finds Python, you can probably get the path that way if you know what you're doing. But uh, this will tell you very explicitly and very quickly how to do it. 
go away. So, import OS stands for operating system library. S is equal to OS dot get CWD, which stands for get current working directory. Get CWD. And then print S. And there's our path. See there? Quite a bit different on my, uh, my machine downstairs in my office. It's hidden in some deep subdirectory. So you could just copy that. You know, stick in a notepad file or something for safekeeping. So that you can use it anytime you need to during this, uh, this exercise. And there we go. That worked for everybody. Were you all able to get the pass? Is it the same on yours as it is on mine? Yep. All right, cool. At least all of our uh, machines are configured similarly, which was not always the case. The instructor's machines sometimes went several years without being updated. So the last thing we want to do is to make a set python.cmd file that would set the path if it's not already done. And the reason I'm showing you this is that if you get to a machine where you don't have admin access to the environment variables, you can still get the path set up appropriately. So we're going to do that. I want us to go back into our scripting directory, your favorite directory full of all your scripts. And then do the shift, control shift, right click, open command window thing here. And then do notepad set python dot cmd, no spaces. That'll bring up our editor. Cannot find a file. Yes, we do want to create a new one. So later on in that Word doc, I give some lines of code that I want us to put. Feel free to go to the Dropbox 7 and grab that Word file and just copy this stuff out of it. It's safer than typing it yourself. Hope this works. I guess I'll find out very soon, won't I? So notice I can make the font a little bit bigger. Notice it's got a directory here, but it's obviously not the right one, right? I'm going to want to put the one that I found here. So I would paste and replace that like that. Now we're good to go. If you were having to type this stuff in by hand and for some reason you couldn't copy and paste it, these are just comments. They could be deleted. Comments in a, in a bat file, in a CMD file. And I put a comment here saying that these are semicolons, not colons, because if you were typing them in yourself and you made them colons, it wouldn't work. All righty, I'm going to save and close my document. You see, all I had to do is replace that one line or fix that one line. Now if I go back to my scripting directory, I should see a CMD file. If you haven't enabled file extensions, you won't see the CMD, but it'll say Windows Command. You double click that, it sets the path variable temporarily. And so now if we did uh, path, I guess it's already set. I was expecting to see it at the end, according to the end of the script, but uh, it was already in the path at an earlier point, so I believe it to optimize the path. All righty. So hopefully that works for you. Go through the document at home, and um, if you're not using Windows at home, just read it and go, yeah, okay, cool. And try to do some of this stuff. Try to get your environment set up so that you can run Python from the CMD prompt. If you already can, great. No further changes made are necessary and then at the end I ask that you upload something saying you know what you were able to do or learn from it and that if you're a Mac user yeah I really enjoyed reading this I still am not going to reference set Python in any of the other ones but I kind of want you to know how to do this stuff if you're not a a really skilled Windows user I mean and you're probably way more skilled than I am but if you don't know how to use the command prompt and CD into this directory and that directory and have an idea of what the path is, you kind of need to know. So that's why I went ahead and went through this. Does that make sense to everybody? We all good? Okay. Okay. 
So if we look, I've tried to make the due dates reasonable. We have, you know, several homework assignments coming up. This one's due, you know, I believe the 13th is this Sunday. The next one is due, well, maybe not this Sunday. Okay, Wednesday, whatever. And then those after it are due Sunday. We also have some quizzes I want you to do, specifically one quiz. If you go to Dropbox Quizzes, you'll see a quiz over chapters two and three. Is that from the book or is that? It's from the book. It may cover stuff that we did in class as well. If you get stuck, you can always Google. You can always text me. My quizzes are designed to be... Have you ever had a, a professor give you a practice exam and then their real exam was different? These quizzes are practice exams. I give you two attempts to do them so that you can learn from them because I really want you all to get 100s on them. That's the goal. It's not a measurement tool so much as a learning tool. You can take the quiz, see, you know, if you were, would have been ready for the exam if I'd slammed it on your desk that day. You can learn from it. You can take it again and get 100 or whatever, a really high 90, and you'll feel real good because those will be averaged in along with your other test scores. So it'll help you out. And whenever I refer to chapters here, I am referring to the physical text because I'm expecting as we go along that the online text and the physical text are going to veer in their contents. So far they've matched in lockstep. Okay, so we were actually, I think, done with chapter two and three. So I'm gonna to go to the online text and check out chapter four. Functions. We played with functions already just a little bit. I know that you've been doing them in your homework. Python gives you a whole bunch of built-in functions. There's the max command. Max, and then inside the parentheses, you give it either a list or a string. And if you give it a list, it'll find the highest value in the list. If you give it a string, it'll find the highest letter in the string according to its own rules, where a lowercase w is the highest letter in this string. What does that mean? Well, the letters are done in ASCII where capital A through capital Z are in the chart and then lower A through lower Z follow that. So it counts a lowercase a as being a higher value than a capital Z, which is different than the way our brain works. So are you really going to call max on a string very often? Not very. So let's go ahead and pop open Python, file, new. Save as September 7. Put it in a good directory, not in the Python subdirectory. So let's make a list. Not that we've talked about lists, but I just want to illustrate the max command. Let's put some things in it, some numbers. 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, Two, whatever. Kind of the numbers in pi. Not sure I got them all. Or obviously I didn't get them all, but I don't remember what comes after the nine. Now let's do print the max uh, item in that list. So I'm going to save it and run it. There we go. We have a nine. That was, in fact, the highest number in the list. Not surprising. Let's do the min. I'm going to do lowercase m is equal to the minimum of anything in that list, and then I'm going to print the lowercase m. Oh, and I had a question that I didn't respond to your text, or your email, I'm sorry, which is, hey, I want to switch to the online version of the class. Is it too late to do that? No, it's not. I'm not going to make any changes. Just start doing it as the online course because you may or may not have noticed that I put all the students in the same, same D2L section and they're all being treated just exactly the same. So, uh, so you don't need to make any changes. Just, just act like you're an online student. Watch the lectures and do the homework. And contact me if you have questions. Hope that's clear. I will still respond to your email. Let's run it. See if it found the minimum. What's the minimum going to be? That's pretty easy to spot, right? What's the lowest value in that list? One, yeah, okay. So run module, 
There we go. So that was the max and that was the min. One textbook I used for one semester called these BIFs, built-in function, that I'm never going to actually use that term. So we have lots of built-in functions. We could get the sum of this list pretty easily. Let's do total is equal to the sum of that list and then print the total out. And there it goes, the total is 25. I'm just going to trust that. I'm not going to add on my fingers and get that. So let's make another list called colors, capital C for colors. Red, green, blue. And let's print the maximum value of that list comma, followed by the minimum value of that list. I think it's going to print red and blue. Can you close oh, for Pete's sake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look what I did here. Definitely a syntax error because a list has to be defined in parentheses, I mean in brackets, and so it needs to be brackets on both sides. Correct that. After blue, there should have been a bracket, and I needed. So we run it. The maximum value of that list was red because it's the highest, you know, closest to Z alphabetically. And the lowest one was blue. Now just to kind of reiterate that point that it doesn't always uh, follow the, the rules that you might think, make blue lowercase and run it again. It's no longer going to say that the uh, minimum is blue. Better not anyways. Okay. It's saying that the maximum is blue and the minimum is green. Why is that? Because it counts lowercase letters as being further along the list than higher than uh, uppercase letters, which is annoying. So like if you had all your songs in your, your music player or whatever, and then all the lowercase ones were in a different place in the list than the uppercase ones and it couldn't sort it directly, that'd be really be annoying. Fortunately, programmers try to take that kind of thing into account. One thing you can do is just convert for sorting purposes everything to uppercase. That kind of solves the problem, even if you keep the original for display. Okay, and then there's LEN, the length. You can find out the length of a string, or you can find out the length of the list. So let's print the length of some word. Some word. Alrighty. Feeling literal today. And then print the length of our colors list and then let's print the length of our original list L. So our, we had three colors so that one's going to be three. This one's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And however long our original list was, maybe also nine. One, two, three. Looks like seven. There we go. Nine words in that, or nine in mine, three in RGB, and seven in those numbers. So we've seen several built-in functions so far. Type conversion functions. We've been using these pretty much since maybe the second or third day we were here. Except I think we usually convert to float so that we could support, uh, you know, floating point numbers. If you use the int function, then whatever is passed in as its argument gets converted into an integer. In other words, it gets rounded down to a whole number. So int 3.999 would round down to 3. Int negative 2.3 would round down to 2. Now it's really interesting that it can handle decimal points if you put them in like that, but if you pass them in as a string, it would not be able to do that. Let's kind of prove that to ourselves. Whoops, wrong window. Run a shell. If you already had a shell open, close it and reopen it or whatever you want. And then do this. 
S is equal to, and then type in a number. And then do the INT version of S. Great, that works. Now do S is equal to 1.1. Now that's an actual number, it's not a string. So if we do INT S, oh, I did uppercase S, INT, oh, I guess I hit caps lock, INT S, it converted that to an int, and it did so by rounding it down. Close and reopen, just so it's up at the top of my screen. So now, s is equal to quote 1.1, like the user just type 1.1 into an input command. And then we do int s like that, and it blows up. Well, if it knew how to do the other one, why didn't it know how to do this one? I don't know, irks me. That's why I always use float. Float of that string is in fact 1.1. We're good to go. So those are two more built-in functions. Float and int. These convert types. And there's a third one. So convert to float, convert to int, and then string converts to string. So if you have a number and you want to convert it to a string, you can do that. String of this, 1.234, is, quote, 1.234, end quote. Honestly, don't do that very often. Not coming up with a real strong reason at the top of my head as to when you would do that. So random numbers. Random numbers are used for games, but not only for games. You can actually calculate the value of pi via random numbers. It sounds absurd. It's called the Monte Carlo method. And we may write a program that does this. But with the Monte Carlo method, you have a formula for a circle that you could use to check to see if any x, y value was within or without the circle, the boundary of the circle. And the Monte Carlo method is you just generate a thousand different random numbers and you count the numbers of the ones that were in the circle and the number that were outside the circle. And um, based on that, you can calculate an approximation of pi. We might do that at some point. So uh, that would have been useful to the Greeks, right? I mean, that's how they calculated pi is they took small stones you know, and just laid them in there, and then they counted the number of the stones that took, went around the edge of the circle, as opposed to the number of stones that filled the circle, and you divide by one by the other, and you get three, or 3.1, or whatever, however close they ever got to it. It's the same idea. So the random module provides functions that will generate pseudo-random numbers. This text is just going to call them random from now on. Why are they called pseudo-random? Because they're not truly random. They're generated based on a formula. And if all the conditions are exactly right, then um, when you ran it again, you would get the same series of random numbers. So the function random returns a random float between 0 and 1 that includes 0 but not 1. Meh. I doubt I'm going to just use random anymore. I mean, uh, like that. I'd rather have something where I could specify the values, like that. I want a random number between 5 and 10, that kind of thing. So let's play with that just a little bit. What we're going to need to do is we're going to have to import the random library. So we really ought to put our imports up at the top of the code, but import random. And if y'all have ever played Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or any of those other type games where you roll up a character and you roll up his strength and his intelligence and his charisma based on three dice, you know, added together, we're going to kind of do something like that. A die roll is a number between one and six. So let's do this. D1 is equal to random dot... I'm going to check this to make sure I don't get a syntax error... Yeah, it's all lowercase. Random dot R-A-N-D-I-N-T, and I want a number between 1 and 6. 
because right, that's what a six-sided die rolls. And then D2 is equal to the same thing. You could just cut and paste. Random dot R-A-N-D-I-N-T, one comma six. And then D3 is equal to random dot R-A-N-D-I-N-T, one comma six. And so now we're gonna figure out what our character strength is. I can't use STR because it means string, drats. I'm gonna call it ST. Pardon? I could, yeah, strength, there, I like that. Or even all uppercase, there. Strength is equal to D1 plus D2 plus D3. Now let's print all that stuff out. D1 comma D2 comma D3 comma equals, or quote equals end quote comma strength in caps. And let's run it. There we go. A 2 and a 4 is a 6, plus a 5 is an 11. And if we ran it again, hopefully we get number values, uh, different values. Well, that time I got a 12. I rolled a 3, 4, and a 5. A 2 and a 1 and a four, 5, and so on. So on. So you use randomness to make games interesting. If there's, like, you're writing a Tetris game. You don't want it to send the same blocks in the same order every time. Or maybe you do, you know, as you, if you're writing some kind of, if you're running some kind of Tetris tournament and you want to make it exactly fair for everybody to have to deal with the same conditions, you might make the same shapes fall in order. But otherwise, you probably want to pick different shapes, you know, as they fall to the ground. And uh, you might, you know, you might make a, gener a randomly generated map so that every time your soldier enters a, you know, a new map, then um, things are in different places. May have given the example in this class, maybe it was another one, but Pac-Man ro roaming around. The ghosts on the original Pac-Man game followed a predetermined pattern. And then to make Ms. Pac-Man harder, some of the ghosts went in random patterns, just so that you couldn't memorize a single pattern and just you know keep doing it over and over and over. So that's the random function, random int. So if we ever want to write something where, like it's a guessing game, I'm thinking of a number between one and a million, why don't you take a guess at it? We'd use the random library in order to do that. I want to remind ourselves that you have two different syntaxes of the import command. If you do import, it'll bring in the entire random library. But if you want, you can just bring in one item from a library. From random import rand int. Now, we don't have to prefix all of our calls to randint with that word random. We can just do this. Print randint. I'm tempted to do this. I'm tempted to copy and paste. But anyways, print randint, you know, 1 to 20. Now we're rolling a big old dodecahedron, a 20-sided die. And there we go. We rolled an 8. We probably did not defeat that monster. So you see that we were able to leave off the library name random if we followed this syntax instead. Do you need to do it that way? No, some, usually it's easier just to do this. But if I'm only using one function from a library, then I may as well do it like that. But if I'm using a whole bunch of different functions from the library, then I don't want to have to do from random import randint, from random import rand float, from random import rand this and that. You know, I wouldn't want to have 20 of these if I could have just done that and brought one in. Anybody getting mysterious syntax errors that you wish that I'd be quiet and come help you with? We're okay? Alrighty. So then we have math functions. The math functions are not built-in functions, just like the random function wasn't. But they're very easily accessible. You can import math 
and then you have access to the math functions. For example, log 10, the 10 based logarithm of a number here. And there's all sorts of math functions. You know what, I don't know how to list, how to get a list of all the functions that are in a library. I just tend to do this. I would pop open uh, Chrome or Firefox, I would type Python 3 math library and it would give me a whole bunch of them. Math.ceiling. If you give a, a couple of numbers, no wait, it returns the ceiling of x, the smallest integer greater than or equal to x. You know if you round down it always goes to the floor. If you round it up it would go to the ceiling. Well that's what math.ceil really is. It's a round up function. The absolute value of x. Wonder why that's called an f. Why wouldn't it just be abs? Eh, let's play with that. It's kind of odd. Fine. Pardon me. I think it probably stands for fine. Find value. Yeah. So I'm going to do import math, and I'm going to check to just see if abs works. Print math.abs of negative 10. It ought to print positive 10. The absolute value, the absolute magnitude of that value is 10. wonder if it'll work. No. All right, so it really is FABS. What would I have needed to do if I did not want to have to type math before FABS? Exactly, from math import FABS. Does it speed your program up if you do that? No. Nah. The only concern is whether you like having to type math dot or not. It's not like, oh, I brought in all those functions so it's going to slow my code down. Nah, it doesn't work like that. So with the ceiling function, you also have a float function. You have an F sum function, which is an accurate floating point sum of all the values. Avoids loss of precision. So you can get uh, rounding errors if you call the generic built-in function sum on a list of floating point numbers. Exponent, that's pretty useful. Log. Power of. Got it. This exponent is e to the power of x, though. It doesn't mean... If you want to take x to the power of y, you use this function. I don't see why we need to do that when we have asterisk asterisk available to us. I'm sure there's a point where it's useful. The square root. There's a cheap hack for getting the square root of a number if you have an exponent function for you. If you do this, x is equal to four, um, 100, and then you did y is equal to x to the power of power of 0 0.5. Raising something to the power of 0.5 is actually taking the square root of it. So after we did that, y would equal 1, would equal 10. Just, just tuck, tuck away in your brain, not like I'm going to ever ask you how to do that. And then the uh, trig functions, cosine, sine, tangent, hypotenuse. I think something was occurring to me and it slipped away. Recently, I had to write a program where you issued commands to trigonometry functions and it was expecting radians rather than degrees, if you remember that from math. And so I had to call one of these functions in order to convert from like 360 degrees or 180 or whatever to the equivalent value of radians, and you could do that. It's easy, there's a whole bunch of math functions, including the all-important math.pi, because we're always using pi. We're, we're obsessed with the area and circumference of circles and spheres and things like that. And then the C math library. You want to know what a complex number is? It's a number that has a, both a real component and an imaginary component, where the imaginary component is a number multiplied by the square root of negative 1, which sounds a little bit weird. I've forgotten practically entirely why you would do that. 
so I'm just going to skip that. So for example, the math.sign function, if you're going to do trigonometry, is expecting radians. So if you wanted to get the sine of 45 degrees, we would have to convert from degrees to radians. We may as well do that just, just because it's, it's fun, right? Okay, so degrees equals, let's find out what the sine of 45 degrees is. Now we're going to have to convert it to radians. So radians is equal to math dot, let me make sure I got the right one now. I wish I hadn't closed that last window. That's what I thought. Okay. So we're going to convert it to radians of our degrees. Now we're going to get the sine of it. S is equal to math.sine of those radians. Then we're going to convert them back to degrees for output. Degrees is equal to math.degrees of that value we just got out of math.sign. And let's print it. And it's been so long since I've taken trigonometry, I have no idea what the sine of 45 is. Well, I'm sure I'll find out real soon. 40.5. Sounds legit. So this is just demoing using the math library. You can add your own functions. Define, print lyrics, print I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay, I sleep all night and I work all day. All right, Monty Python fans will recognize that. So DEF instructs Python that we're about to define a function and then we give a definition, excuse me, a name to the function and then we use some parentheses and inside those parentheses we can list parameters that will get filled in with the arguments. After that, you have your colon, and since you have a colon, you have to indent everything after that. And then to indicate the end of the function, you either use a return statement or you just stop indenting. So let's create some functions for ourselves. So define, say hi. Colon, print, hi there. Very similar to what we did in one of our homework assignments. Define, say hi to. We're going to write a, a different version of say hi. That takes a name. Print, hello, comma, name, plus, well, I'm not going to get fancy with it, exclamation mark, like that. That's not going to look quite right, and I'll show you a fix for that. Now let's write one more function that accepts an extra variable, which is the number of times that it's going to say hi. Define say hi three, where we pass in both the name and the number of times we want to say hi. That would require a loop. So you know what? I'm not going to do that. Let's just skip that. So first I'm going to call say hi, and it's just going to print hi there. Then I'm going to call say hi, and I'm going to pass in a name. Bob Roberts. Say hi too. Thank you very much. If you didn't catch that, I was trying to use the same function name, but it wasn't going to work because I defined it as say hi too. All right, it says hi there, and then it says hello, Bob Roberts. 
Now, the only complaint I have about that is it put a space between the name and the exclamation mark. I could fix that. Here's how I would fix that. I would try taking away that comma and replacing it with a plus sign so that it would just append this string to that one. Concatenate. Concatenate's our technical term for adding one string to another. Yeah, I like that better. Tell you what though, I'm going to make one more change because it's going to give me a lecture point. I'm going to change that back like this. It's going to say print hello name and we're not going to put the exclamation mark there, right? But instead, we're going to do name plus equals and then an exclamation mark like that. We added this line of code above the print statement. And then run it. That didn't work. I, I, I went, somehow I lost my say hi too. All right. Got to be say hi too. Apparently I undid one too many levels. There we go. And so now it's got my desired output. It's put the exclamation mark on it. Is that terrible? I changed my data there, you know. Nah, it's okay. Because what you pass into a function as an argument, this is what's known as an argument. It's the data that's being passed into the function. This is the parameter. The parameter is what gets a copy of this data. This is not equal to that. It's just got a copy of it. So it's fine to add an exclamation mark to it. It doesn't change this. Let's kind of prove that to ourselves. I don't remember if we've done a name already. Name is equal to Sarah Sue. And then say hi to name and then print that name to see if it changed it. So these are the three lines that I just added. Why I'm doing this is because I'm curious if after it returns from this function, if name now has an exclamation mark at the end because it kind of looks like maybe it does after we did that. That plus equals just means add an exclamation mark onto the end of it. Same as doing name equals name plus exclamation mark. And when we got back from the function, it still just said Sarah Sue. That means that the name, the data contained in that variable did not change. That's because Python, like a great many other languages, is a pass by copy language. It copies the argument that's going in there. There are other languages that let you do pass by pointer or pass by reference. This is not one of them. What do you use functions for? You do them to define a block of code so that you don't just have to copy and paste that code over and over and over. And I'm sure I've given examples of this already. But if you had a function that did like 10 different lines worth of code, you wouldn't want to have to just copy those 10 lines of code every time you wanted to make that happen. If you could give it a single name and invoke it. It's like if you had to tell somebody where to go, rather than give them directions every single time, you'd rather just write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to them, and then they could go, and then you could use that piece of paper and give it to anybody else, and they could follow the same instructions. So, for example, say we had a mathematical equation. I'm going to call it DERP. Can't think of a good name for it. And what it does is it sets z equal to x and then it adds 2 to z. So z plus equals 2 and then it, then it multiplies that by y. So z asterisk equal y. 
and then it adds 100 to it, so z plus equals 100, and so on, right? Now that's four different things, and then we're going to return a value from our function. We're going to return z. That means pass it back. So I'm going to print the derp value of 1 and 1. Then I'm going to print the derp value of 2 and 2. Then I'm going to print the derp value of 3 and 3. And there we go. These are our derp values. Whatever. The point is, is we had an algorithm here. We had four steps that we were able to invoke just with a single word. Any function could be thousands of lines of code. Could just be one line of code, but if it's only one line of code, then I question why you'd make a function out of it. So I wouldn't want to have to do these four lines of code every single time I wanted to print a dirt value of a pair of numbers if I could just put them in a function. We'll see many more examples of that. We'll write a lot of functions. And uh, if you took my uh, fundamentals class, we did a lot with turtles, and we put stuff, the turtle stuff in functions so that we wouldn't have to re, you know, we wouldn't have to enter 20 commands every single time that we wanted the turtle to relocate himself and then draw a new shape. So here's their example. Define print lyrics. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. And then they have something called repeat lyrics. Repeat lyrics calls print lyrics and then it calls print lyrics again. And then they call repeat lyrics. So the first line of code that actually gets executed is the first unindented line of code. This doesn't do anything. It defines a function, but it doesn't do anything. So if we click the run button, it would go, okay, I have a function to find, but I'm not going to actually do anything. And then it would find this function and go, okay, I have another function to find, great, but I'm not going to actually do anything. And then it go, aha, I have a command. It's an unintended command. I better do it. So repeat lyrics would bop up here. And now we're in this module, this function. And the first thing in that says is do print lyrics. So it would hop up here. It would print, I'm a lumberjack, and I'm okay, I sleep all night, and I work all day. And it would return out of there. Why would it return? Because it hits the first unindented line, which is an implied return. So now it's done with that one, and it comes down here. It runs print lyrics again. Hops up here and displays, I'm a lumberjack, and I'm okay, I sleep all night, and I work all day. Then it comes back here. It's done with that call to print lyrics, and so it returns out of here, and now we're done with the program. Hope that kind of made sense. It goes here, it runs to here, it goes up to print lyrics, it comes back, it calls print lyrics again, it comes back, and then it returns out of repeat lyrics. So that's called flow of execution. What gets run first? The first thing that gets run is the first unit in a line of code. And then our flow of execution caused it, this is a function call, that's one of the forms of flow of execution. Let's write down the four forms of the flow of execution if I can remember them. There are function calls, I better, there's top down, there's a better term for that. Sequential. That's better. There are loops. And then there are selections. Decisions. Most of the time we see sequential. This entire program until we got to these DEFs was sequential. So I'm going to cut that function call and I'm going to move it to the bottom of my list here. Sequential is just starting at the top and going down. Like this. That's the first thing it did. That's the next thing it did. That's the next thing. That's the next thing. And so on. And it just kept running all the way into the bottom. It skipped a little bit of code, though. 
It got here and it went, oh, that's a function. Great, I'm gonna store it, but it's just like filing it away. It doesn't actually do anything. Just a sec. Then we, we got here, it was still going top down, but then we hit a function call. And so it zipped up here and it did these things in sequential order and it came back. Then it zipped back up here again and ran those three things with different arguments and came back. And then it zipped up here, ran those statements again with the third pair of arguments and it returned. So this code here exhibits two of our flow of execution, sequential statements and loops, it, nope, and function calls. A loop is when you get it to repeat the same code over and over and over. And a selection is an if statement. Yes, sir? Can you use that, like, the, the following, can you use that in, uh, like, an if loop, or, or an if statement, I guess, and then, like, the pro back up to, like, ask the question again to see if the answer was right? Or... Exactly. Right. You, you might want to uh, force them to enter good data. Like if you ask them for their name and they type in something that's the only one name or if it's only one letter long or something like that. Or if you ask them for a number and they don't type in a number, you could use a function for that. And you can make the function have a loop so that it gets good data and then returns it. Or your loop could call the function. So you could do it either way. And what never seems to make the most sense to you at the time. Let's do that. Let's write a function that will ask the user for a number between 1 and 10. And if it's not right, it won't let them escape. So it won't let them do, it won't let the program continue until they actually enter a good data. So I'm just going to call this get num because I'm not coming up with a very creative word for it. And it's going to be a loop. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set a variable equal to zero. And then we're going to do while this number is less than one or this, we've talked about ors, have we not? Or this number is greater than 10. Keep repeating this question. Print enter a number between 1 and 10. And this is actually my preference for this kind of thing. If you ask, would you prefer one or the other? I'd rather write a function that does the looping so that my main code is cleaner. So let's get that input. Num is equal to, but what if they type in something lousy? What if they type in something with a, uh, you know, letters rather than words? We're going to want to use a try except block. So try this code. Num is equal to the integer version of the input that they type in. But if they type in garbage, if they don't type in a number, we need to print an error message. Not a valid number. And then down here, we're going to return that number. So this has to be lined up with this while loop, like that. Yes, sir? Will it not matter if your input's wrong or not? It's not going to print this unless there was an exception here, unless they gave us bad data here. Because that's what the except does. It's kind of an if statement. If there was an error, do that. If there was no error, don't do that. If it gets to here because there wasn't an exception, or if it was, the number is still not valid because it's not less, it's not between 1 and 10. So then it would keep looping until they finally gave in and typed something that was between 1 and 10, and it would return. So let's actually call our function. Age is equal to get num, whatever, and then print age. Not quite sure I totally answered your question. I want to run it and see if I have any syntax errors. And if it worked, great. Okay, so here we go. I'll bring the code back. You may not have gotten it all typed in. Enter number between 1 and 10. I'm going to type in garbage. 
Not a valid number. Enter a number between 1 and 10. 100. I didn't give an error message there, so I'm not totally psyched about this as, a, as an input function, but at least it didn't return something. I finally typed in a good number and it printed it out. We would probably need one more if statement that could print an error saying that your number was not between 1 and 10. Let's tack that on. If number is less than 1 or number is greater than 10, we're going to print an error message. Print must be between 1 and 10. And it's the end of class. We were having too much fun. Enter number between 1 and 10. I'll bring the code back in just a second. 25, hopefully it said uh, number must be between 1 and 10. Kind of working. It's validating all of our input, and eventually I type in a 1, and it's happy. All right, guys, I need to make a Dropbox for this so that y'all can upload it. And then I'll bring the code back in if you didn't get it all going. And I'll walk around and help y'all if you have time. If you didn't get it working, that's okay. But if you have, you know, five minutes, I also have five minutes so we can get it working. Alright guys, refresh your Dropbox. You should see it there now. You can upload your PY script into it.